Yesterday, before Perry and I started home from Berkeley, it was only yesterday, I received a text from Candy that ended with the words, be alert, the world needs more alerts. It reminded me a bit of today's admonition, stay awake. And then I was thinking of a song from Mary Poppins, written by Robert B. and Richard M. Sherman. Stay awake, don't rest your head, don't lie down upon your bed, while the moon drifts in the skies. Stay awake, don't close your eyes. Though the world is fast asleep, though your pillow is soft and deep, you're not sleepy as you seem. Stay awake, don't nod and dream. Stay awake, don't nod and dream. About the time I fell in love with the movie Mary Poppins and coveted the album, when I was nine years old, I became terrified by an event and had a summer of extreme anxiety. I became convinced, as in our gospel text, that if I closed my eyes and tried to sleep, someone would break into our house. I can still see my open bedroom door reflecting the light from the bathroom across the hall. I lay in bed night after night, absolutely focused on that light and the lack of motion, the lack of shadows, that said to me that for this moment, everything was all right. Problem was, I couldn't trust that if I closed my eyes, everything would stay all right. I felt like Atlas, if I had known who Atlas was, shouldering the weight of the entire world, not understanding my anxiety and wanting to trust that God would take care of me, but not quite able to get there. My watching somehow kept the bad things from happening. I was much more successful at staying awake than Jane and Michael Banks, who stubbornly fought only their nanny's order that they go to sleep. Hypervigilance. On the first Sunday of Advent, we focus on Jesus' parousia, the second coming. Then, like an inwardly curving labyrinth, on the next two Sundays, We'll focus on the start of Jesus' earthly ministry, then on his incarnation, his becoming one of us. He gets closer and more immediate with each week of Advent. But on this first Sunday, we're out on the edges, looking for what has not yet happened, trying to handle free-floating anxiety, because Jesus uses the parable of the thief in the night to explain what his return will be like. We know that there are whole denominations that specialize in just this watching and waiting, although they handle the uncertainty by trying to make it more certain. Who will stay? Who will go? Is there such a thing as the rapture? To me, these questions are less important than others. As Scott Hosey says about this passage, in the Center for Excellence in Preaching. If you tell me burglars are coming next Wednesday around 1.30 a.m. to smash through my kitchen window, I'm going to be there and be ready. This is useful information. But if you tell me that my house is going to be robbed, certainly robbed, at some point in the dead of night, sometime in the next 15 years, I'm going to start to wish that you had never told me because I wonder if I will ever sleep again. This is not terribly useful information. Let's assume that Jesus is trying to be useful, however, and is not trying to trip us up. How then are we to understand his words and his analogy? <clears throat> Perhaps what he's saying is that if you did know when, for sure you'd do something. In the case of the return of the Son of Man, we do not know when, but we do know that it will happen, no matter how long it takes. And surely this information is useful on some level too, because we overextend Jesus' imagery if we make Jesus return out to be something as bad and unhappy as a burglary. I've heard a quote attributed at various times to either St. Francis or Martin Luther. And it says, 
If I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. Or to bring the idea to bear on our gospel text, if I knew the world would end tomorrow, like Noah and his family and others, I would continue eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and even sleeping until I understood that I needed to do something different. The difference would be in my attitude. I would continue living in the present, but with hope for the future, born of my faith in the one who, out of love, gives me and all other creatures life. This wild, unpredictable, sometimes painful, but always glorious life. There's a TV commercial by Allstate that someone shared online. I haven't seen it on TV myself, but I was mesmerized by the sound of a young girl's voice saying these words. There are man-eating sharks in every ocean, but we still swim. Every second, somewhere in the world, lightning strikes, but we still play in the rain. Poisonous snakes can be found in 49 of the 50 states, but we still go looking for adventure. <coughs> a car can crash, a house can crumble, but we still drive and love coming home. Because I think deep down we know all the bad things that can happen in life. They can't stop us from making our lives Good. I love these words up until the last couple of lines, and then I would amend them. I would say instead, because I think deep down we know all the bad things that can happen in life, they can't stop us from living in hope and courage with God's help. Because we never completely succeed in making our lives good, if we delude ourselves into thinking that we have succeeded, then we aren't staying awake. We live in the already and not yet that is the time between. Pastor Laura Thielander, in a short meditation on this text, highlights one stanza of a hymn called, As the Dark Awaits the Dawn. It says, As the dark awaits the dawn, so we await your light. O star of promise, scatter night, loving bright, loving bright, till shades of fear are gone. She continues, it's an increasingly rare experience these days to find oneself immersed in enough darkness to be able to see the stars in the night sky. More and more of us live in cities and towns where bright lights shine 24-7 upon our streets and buildings. In our homes, the glare of computer screens and personal electronic devices reflect on our faces as we keep ourselves busy with both work and play. We may hope these lights would shield us from experiencing darkness where fears and anxieties reside, but they also often keep us from seeing the Advent star of promise. As we enter this season of Advent, we are invited to go off the grid for a time, to enter the darkness that surrounds us and await God's coming. <coughs> May this season kindle our deep desire for the only true light that can scatter our fears. There's a difference between hypervigilance and anticipation. We already know the one who's coming tomorrow or in a thousand years. The hour may be unexpected, but his presence is not. Waking or sleeping, we listen for his voice. May the peace of the Son of Man banish your fears. <laughs>